Okay, here goes. Robin Elliott has trained and coached thousands of business owners and entrepreneurs in his seminars over 33 years in Africa, Britain, Canada, and the United States. Robin has written no less than 15 books, and he has appeared on television and radio stations in Britain, Africa, and Canada. His specialty is leverage and collaboration in business. Take it away, Robin. Good stuff. Um, I was very impressed to hear that most of the people that were participating mm. actually agree that they will be, that we're in a recession, mm. and, and I do believe it's gonna get a lot worse. Mm. So that was, that was good to hear. Um, we're all on the same page. It's interesting to me that 76 people signed up for this uh, thing, and, and we have 22 on the call. So, again, you know, the people that should be hearing it are hearing it, and that's important. So you'll see at the bottom right-hand corner here, coronavirus is saying to the economic collapse and poverty, it's your turn. And most people are still in denial, but we are heading into a difficult time. So how, how best to rise above that? And there's a story about the fellows that were in a boat in a ship, and they were dying of thirst because they'd run out of fresh water. So they didn't know what to do, and a boat was, another ship was approaching them, so they signaled to the other ship, and they said, you know, please give us water. We need fresh water. We're dying of thirst, and um, we can't, you know, we, we can't go on. And the ship that was coming to them signaled back, and they said, let down your bucket. And they thought, well, they didn't understand, so they, they kept on signaling them, please give us water. And the other ship that was approaching them kept saying, let down your bucket until the other ship had gone off into the distance. And they were convinced that they were going to die of, of thirst. And then the captain said, why not let down the bucket and just try it? And he, when he pulled the bucket up, it was fresh water. And it's actually in an area near Brazil where the Amazon River actually flows into the ocean. And it's such a strong flow that in that area for 300 miles, you can, in fact, uh, get uh, fresh water is, is on top of the seawater. So often when we think everything is lost, uh, the opportunity is right there. Like that story about um, the bucket letting down and acres of diamonds. There are always opportunities. And in a groups like, groups like this, there are resources. So facts to consider, as of 2015, small businesses employed about 70.5% of the total private uh, labor force in Canada, and many of those who lost their jobs will not be re-employed by the same employer. Many of those people actually are not going to get jobs again. Some will remain jobless. We're heading into dark financial times, but we can prosper if we make the right decisions. Smart people seek alternative uh, situations, alternative solutions and it's never too late to start over. So some of the concerns that people have is number one, how to survive financially. How do we survive financially given that we've lost our job, given that this has gone wrong, that's gone wrong. People are depressed, they're worried, they, they feel that there's nothing that they can do, upset about losses and rising debt, and many people are feeling like there's no way out. And, and that there will be social unrest, which they very well could be. The question is, where do we go? What, what choices can we make that will work for us? So first of all, we need to understand that we can't go back and make a new start. The past is over, but you can start now and make a new ending. So instead of worrying about what's lost, let's worry about what we can gain. And the old yin and yang thing, where nothing is sure, everything is possible. Where there is crisis, there is opportunity, and the greater the crisis, the greater the opportunity. So you've got to think, how will we weather this depression that, that we're in? You know, how will we handle this? Is it a blessing in disguise? Because for some people it can be, and it's our choice. Will we flourish or flounder? And really, is, it, it really is our choice. How we respond is our choice. We can't control what happened, but we can control how we respond to that. So there's three tricks that our minds play on us. And uh, if you're making a noise and you're not muted, you will keep appearing on the screen, so please don't mute yourself. So first of all, sunk cost fallacy. Uh, this is, I've invested too much time, too much money, too much energy, 
um, in something to walk away and to cut bait. You know, I spent so much time uh, qualifying for this uh, position or this this job that I have. I spent, I went to university, I invested so much, I can't afford to walk away. And so they'd rather go down with the ship than cutting bait. It's a sunk cost fallacy. Many people suffer from that, they get stuck. Confirmation bias is looking for ways or evidence to justify our beliefs. So we, we, miss, we don't see stuff that, that is in effect is what I often experience uh, when people accuse me of being a conspiracy theory theorist or doom and gloom or something. The fact is, um, the backfire event is the effect is when our core beliefs are challenged, we believe them even more, even more strongly. And that's when people get aggressive, when they think, well, maybe what I believed isn't really true. Uh, that's when they get um, aggressive. So we have to be aware of the, the tricks that our minds will play on us to block us and restrict us. So we need to be open-minded. We need to take off the judge's robes and really consider doing new things in a new way. Think outside our boxes, we're all in boxes, and have the right attitude, the right philosophy. Um, you can't change the direction of, your, of the wind, but you, can't, you can adjust your sails. And so the, the businesses, uh, like Craig's and Dennis's that are that are adjusting their businesses to cope with a new reality, those are the ones that will succeed. We have to be flexible now, even if it means making a complete change. And there you see the robin sitting on the uh, branch. If the branch falls, the bird's going to fly away. He's not going to go down with the branch. We need to be like the bird. We, we need to be able to move on and not be attached to our, our situation that we're in or the career that we've identified ourselves with. Because you are not what you do. You are not your career. You are not your profession. You are free to do whatever you want to do. And that's the beauty of, of change. The weakness of pessimists is that the average person will do more to avoid a loss than to gain a benefit. So they will rather repurpose, instead of rather than repurpose their money to make it work for them, they, they prefer to keep onto their money and lose it through inflation. We know that the real inflation rate is not 2 or 3%, as the governments tell us. If you measure it correctly, it's closer to 10%, and it's increasing fast. So even if it only stayed at 10%, within five years, you would have lost 50% of your net worth. And the question is, how much do you want to lose? So rather than trying a new career, they insist on trying, waiting to find a similar job or position to the one they had before, which they might not get. And so in South Africa, we have baboons. This looks like a bear, but it's supposed to be a baboon. Um, the baboons in South Africa strip the maize fields. They, they strip the maize, they stick it under their arm and it just falls out the back, but they keep on stripping, you know, stealing more and more maize. And so the farmers have to catch them. So what they do is they get a pumpkin, they hollow it out and they chain it down to a tree and then they make a small hole in the pumpkin. So the it's just big enough for the baboon to stick his hand in, and then he grabs the pits inside the pumpkin and he can't pull his hand out. And even though he's, he sees the, the farmer approaching to, to catch him, uh, he'd rather get caught than let go of the pits. And we see that happening with people, they get stuck. Their, their greed um, causes their downfall because they don't want to change. So we need to stop the financial bleeding, as Greg said so wisely earlier on, Dr. Greg Jerry. Um, we need to create a reliable residual income, and we need as much money as possible, as fast as possible, with the safe, safely and with maximum leverage. So it, without leverage, you're really just selling your time. You, you're basically selling your time for money. So we need to do that, and we need to do it as safely as possible. So, you know, people all say, I need a job, and they sit and they, they sit in their apartments feeling sad and crying and, and, you know, feeling sorry for themselves because they really think they need a job or they need work. But the fact is you don't need a job. You need a reliable growing income. So entrepreneurs know that they can make a lot more in a, in a, in a business than they can ever make in a job. And in fact, they have a lot more security in a business than you'll ever have in a job because you can't fire yourself. I haven't fired myself yet in 33 years. 
and I probably wouldn't fire myself. But um, in a job, we know that that can change, you know, very quickly. So we don't need a job. We need a gr reliable growing income. And we need to get paid what we're worth, not what some boss thinks you're worth. So the quickest way to get rich is taking a luxury that is reserved for the rich and making it available to the masses. That's the business that I'm in. That's what they do. So how can you take a luxury that is available to the rich, reserved for the rich, and make it available to the masses? And when the world is financially sick, which it is now, and it's going to get a lot worse, and you have the cure, then you make money. Right? So we want to have the cure. Just the people come up with a cure for this coronavirus are going to make money. If you have a cure for people, you will make money. So we need seven things in a good business. Now, if you are, you're all already in your own businesses, I know that. Just think of these things and see to what extent your business um, coincides with us. To what extent does your business come up on all these seven points? Because if it does, you're gonna be very secure in your business, you'll be a lot more secure, you'll be a lot happier, and you'll make more money. So first of all, residual income or repeat sales. If you have to keep on going out and making a sale, finding prospects, pitching what you're doing, pitching your service, pitching your, your product, and there's no residual, if there's no repeat on that, then you're really just a hard sell salesperson at the end of the day. If you have to, like if you're selling houses, for example, if you have to keep on finding a prospect, selling a house, it's gonna take time before he buys another house. Statistically, most of them don't even give referrals. Um, it's a very hard, cycle to create to create so we need residual income secondly protection of our wealth and privacy the wealth because of, of inflation uh, people are print, they're printing money like it's going out of fashion stock market is in a dead cat bounce at the moment so people have got a, a fake optimism but the reality is that the, the world is in trouble financially and they want to protect their privacy um, your privacy is at risk. We know how people are being controlled and censored and hacked and spied on. Number three, um, affordable opportunity. If you want somebody to work with you, it has to be an affordable low entry barrier for them to buy or to do business with you or to participate with you. It's got to be a low enough entry barrier. And uh, Jay Abraham always used to say, you know, the lower the barrier or no barrier is the best way to to do business. The more, the lower the barrier, the easier it is for people to interact with you. If you make it difficult, it's going to be more difficult. So working from home, number four, or anywhere else in the world where you can literally take your laptop or your phone and put your business on your laptop or on your phone and move and be flexible, that won't just be for um, convenience, it'll also be for your safety. So a lot of the stores in the U.S., as we know, are, are battling with, um, with stock on the shelves. And I believe a lot of that is because they want to avoid being looted too, too much. So, you know, I think there's, they're expecting a lot of social unrest. So it's good to have a business that is flexible, where you can work wherever you are, and you can take your business with you and move quickly. Number five, leverage and collaboration. I specialized in teaching business owners that for 30 years, and it's very important. Without leverage and without collaboration, you're basically a self-employed salesperson, and, and you're very limited. I once had to do a, a seminar in London, England, and I had the next night I had to be on the radio, and I got laryngitis just before I left. I'd been paid in advance. The flights had been booked. The hotel was booked. Um, I luckily I managed to do it, but it was very difficult. Now, if it's a more serious uh, health issue, you can lose your business when that happens. So we need to be able to collaborate with others in a team. We need to be able to leverage the resources and skills of other people in order to make a business really stable and strong and growing and to optimize the potential. And number six, a maximum demographic or psychographic model. Um, if you take the guy that is just servicing his local, his local uh, environment, like a plumber or somebody that paints houses, he's got limited time, limited resources, limited demographic 
probably a limited psychographic model because only certain people can afford him, only certain group of society can afford him. So it's more and more and more limited the amount of people that can buy his product or service. The more people that can afford your product in over a bigger uh, space, a bigger area, obviously more people can buy your product and service. The more people you can help, the more money you make. So we know that the more people you can help, the more problems you can solve, the more money you will make. You want the maximum demographic or psychographic model possible. And then number seven, a viable, believable, and proven product or service that people need and want. So, you know, people can say they need something or they can say that they want something, but unless they really have to have it, they might let it go. So even now, um, a lot of financial planners are finding that people are letting their letting their life insurance go. They're not paying. So life insurance companies are reducing the premiums and reducing the cover. Once you've reduced it, it's unlikely that they'll go back up again. So they're going to have chargebacks and all sorts of things. So we need something that people need it and want it badly enough that they're going to stay with you. And then the opportunity should ideally conform to these two books. The one is anti-fragile. Um, it's a long book, it's 500 pages, but it's really good. So you can also watch the, listen or watch to the um, Google talk on anti-fragile by uh, Nassim Taleb. It's an excellent book. And basically it describes two different kinds of businesses. What happens to them when there's a disruption, when there's disorder, when there's a black swan like we have with COVID-19. Uh, when something like that happens, how does the business react? Does it collapse or does it prosper? And we see that happening all around us. A lot more businesses are closing down. Uh, we just closed down our signage company. We own half of a signage company that's been closed down. It was, it's a fragile business. So an anti-fragile business is ideal. That's the ideal business to have. And then uh, this book by the rabbi Daniel Lappin is outstanding. It's called Thou Shall Prosper. And it tells you why Jewish people are so successful. It's not because of the high IQ of Ashkenazi Jews not because they work together, it's because of their, their verbal traditions um, that they have. And it's, it's an absolutely fascinating book. But if you read that, I think you'll find it very useful to model your business around that. And then we want certain things. So the extent to which your business is valuable and unique is the extent to which you succeed. So on the bottom left-hand uh, block there, if it's not valuable and not unique, you're not gonna make any money. If it's not valuable, but it's very unique, you probably like a local artist that is a starving artist. He's got a very unique product that nobody wants uh, because it's not valuable to them, but it's unique. If it's valuable, but not unique, you have to compete on price and now you become a Walmart. Um, so ideally you want something to be valuable and unique. The more valuable and the more unique, the more money you can make. It's, it's that simple. So other, look where you are on those quadrants. Right? Valuable and unique is what you want. We need to find a, a, find a need and fill it, but the vast majority of startup businesses fail completely or they never earn a viable income for the owner. So if you're thinking of getting into business now and you haven't been in business, you want to find a proven a business with a, with a track record. You don't want to start a new business now necessarily because chances are it's going to fail. So you want to be really careful about coming up with new ideas unless they, they, there is a prior model to that. So that's not to be negative about new things and, and pivoting. It's just to be realistic. And then find a proven system with a track record, support, training, induction that's going to work. I had a, a friend, uh, I was actually coaching a business outside of uh, Edmonton, very successful business, line finding business, and they needed a general manager. And I sent them a general manager, but there was no induction. So the guy got the position as general manager, but he was never inducted into the business, he ended up getting fired. So there's gotta be induction and training and support for anybody getting into a new business. And then a product that people need and want. We spoke about that. But, you know, people say, well, you know, we got great soap and, and great, you know, face wash. That's fantastic. But they can also get that somewhere else and probably a lot cheaper. So we got to think about the product that we have. 
And then this one is really simple, but it's really important. <laughs> Usually the simple things are what work. Um, you need vision, skills, incentives, resources, and action plan. So if there's no vision, you have confusion. If there's no skills, you have anxiety. If there's no incentives, you have resistance. If there's no resources, you have frustration. And if there's no action plan, you have false starts. So you want to evaluate your business on that as well. Make sure that it fits all of those criteria and all those seven points and that it fits into those four, those, those quadrants where you know it's valuable and unique. And then you, you, you're far more likely to succeed in your business, but more, more importantly, you'll optimize the amount of money you can make. And the more money you make, the more people you can help that don't have the ability to make money. So we all know that Robert Kiyosaki, rich, rich Dad, Poor Dad, the Four Quadrants, everybody knows that. You've got to make sure that you're on the right-hand side, that the business owner and investor side. You want to be able to leverage. You want to be able to have collaboration. You want to be able to leverage your money. Only 5% of the population do that. 95% of the wealth is what they earn. They have far less taxes to deal with, and they know how to make business happen. So when you have a model that fits these two quadrants on the right-hand side, you're far more likely to attract people to work with you that you can collaborate with, and then you can leverage that. Um, once you, you move on to the left-hand side, you own a job or you have a job. Having a job is pretty much the worst thing you can do. And that's been proven over and over, and, and especially now people are realizing just how fragile a job is. It's not, there's no such thing as job security. People that know that don't have a successful business or they've never run one, but there's no such thing as job security. And even government uh, jobs are not secure because you've got people and you've got politics. And so they have to be realistic. We need to build a life that we don't need a vacation from. Um, it, it's amazing to me how people look forward to hump day and they look forward to, you know, thank God it's Friday. But we need to build a business that we are passionate about. I always say I'm on a mission with a commission. And the business that I'm in is Carrot Bars. Uh, Greg Jerry is in the same business. You can talk to either of us. But our product is, is physical gold. And we are, it's a very strong, stable uh, uh, company with a very good track record. We create wealth. We help people protect their wealth. And we help them to protect their privacy. And we stop the bleeding that is coming from inflation. And we can help a lot of people that way. And we do. So I wanted to finish early so that we can, I can take questions because that always makes, it, makes a difference. And this is not just to get you to join my business, too, but to help you to make sure that your business is aligned with these different criteria. And that's my, my information over there if you want to get hold of me. But those are the criteria that we should use for any business. And the, to the extent that your business conforms to those criteria is the extent to which you'll succeed. So at this point, does anybody have any questions about any of these slides? I think you have to unmute everybody, Robin. Okay. Uh, just find out how to do that. Must I shall stop sharing the screen or? Uh, there we are. And unmute all. Okay, so Robin is uh, open for questions. Uh, I, I just have a question about the seven things in a good business. I just lost the last two on that slide. Okay, let's just go back to those. Dennis, I will be publishing this video in, oh, okay. the, in the next 24 hours. Okay, okay, then I don't need to, uh, I can find it on there. Well, I think Robin's, uh, Robin's. Oh, okay. So there we are. Um, so maximum demographic psychographic model. So our, our business is in 140 countries. Uh, people can get into this business anywhere from a free account to buy stuff up to, you know, $7,000 uh, so and more. So whatever, wherever they feel comfortable. So the maximum amount of people can afford it in 140 different countries. And number seven, it's got to be viable, believable, proven product or service that everybody needs. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. 
Mm. Well, Robin, I'd just like to make a comment if I could. <clears throat> Something really um, touched my heart, what you said, the, that one of the reasons to succeed powerfully in a business is your ability to help other people. And I had the privilege last summer of traveling all through the Philippines and I was able to help a lot of people there. Today, I spoke to a woman from South Africa, um, you know, single mom, um, husband died, um, one daughter, and then her, something happened to her sister. She had to look after those four kids plus the mother. And she was just like, I don't know what to do. I, you know, I found your video online. I, I think I have to do something. So, you know, I'm now going to go on to help her and because I'm doing well in a business. I have that privilege. So just thanks for mentioning how important it is to succeed in a, in a business. Well, you've helped a lot of people, Greg. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Uh, I would like to ask about one of the business kind of a rule number six, which is called maximum demographic. Yep. So it's about the job. I'm a little bit confused about the business because online business and word now is targeting online it's called like a massive demographic already like every business they say like okay that you reach now to the world but technically practically i don't i don't feel it that way because i feel like the more you reach to people the more you get lost somehow in in the whole world how can you <laughs> become to become all things to all men then of, then you do you lose credibility so the ideal thing is to have that big demographic, but to be able to have it big enough that you can specialize. So for example, if you take the doctor that works on knees, but he can work all over the world, he's a knee specialist, he just fixes knees or knee surgeon. He's gonna do a lot better than the general practitioner who can help anybody anywhere. But because he's, but you need that big demographic in order to be able to specialize and still have enough potential in, income. But if you're all things to all men, oh, I can help any business anywhere with anything, you've got no uniqueness. So you lose out that way. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Robin, what is a question that uh, other presentations you've given, what, what is the most common one or two questions that you receive? I find that the biggest problem that people have is when I mentioned that uh, sunk cost fallacy, that people say, you know, I've been doing this for so long, I'm really good at what I do, I, I can't leave it and now change and do something different. And they want to maintain their focus on doing that. But if that ship is, is busy sinking, um, and sometimes that's because the world has changed. So you don't want to go out and buy a blockbuster right now. You know, a, a blockbuster video is probably not a good investment to make right now. But there are people that they got a blockbuster video and they'll hang on there until they're completely bankrupt because they've got, you know, that's, that's the way they're thinking. So I always say to people, listen, as long as you, you can check something out without going all the way, and if it's the right thing for you, you'll know. And then, and then you've got to have the, the guts to be able to make a move. So I, I wrote a book recently called Starting Over. And I said, you know, you've got to be able to start over. You've got to reinvent yourself because the world is changing. Even, even our bodies are changing continually. You know, I always use the example, like if you look in my background here, you can see there's a banner here that says together we can do amazing things. Well, there's a reason why that banner is there. It's because that used to be a drinks cabinet. But now it's a medicine cabinet because I'm old. You know, I've got to be able to adjust. <laughs> I don't need to look, look at the medicine all the time. So, you know, you're not looking at single malt whiskey there. So if we can adjust enough, um, and that's people have a big problem adjusting. I, I think they, they feel they're letting themselves down when they make a change. Ryan? Muted, right? Okay. Good now. I was just wondering if um, if there's questions that you wish people would ask. If there was a question, like given a man of your knowledge and the experiences you have, do you feel that when people ask you questions, 
there's a, maybe a question that they should be asking that they, you don't commonly get asked? I think the, the biggest question that people should ask and that I always wish they would ask is, do I have to give up what I'm doing to start something new? And, and, and I always say to people, you know, don't just throw away what you've got to try something new because it might not be the right thing for you. It might be a good thing, but it might not be right for you. So ease into it. You know, you don't have to throw away, like you find people that have got a job and then they give up their, their job to jump into a new opportunity and they go bankrupt. So I say, you know, you don't have to give up what you're doing. You just need to ease into something. And, and so you're not lying awake at night, never invest more than you can afford to lose. You know, take it easy. So you, you're relaxed, you're not pressurizing anybody, you're not pressurizing yourself. Your wife isn't beating you up. You know, what did you do with all my money? You know, it's much easier. So you can ease into something and test it. And when it starts working for you, then you can say, great, this is better than what I had. Or no, it's not better, let me go back. But at least I had the courage to, to try something new. Good question, thanks. Uh, Anissa, you're muted. You're muted. Yeah, there we go. Um, when it comes to investing, um, it sounds like you're into gold. Uh, what do you recommend when it comes to silver? Like, is there one that's gonna be better than the other? Yeah, I think silver is good, but I think gold is more you know, people will, will deal with gold a lot easier than they will with um, crypto or with, with silver. So, you know, crypto is fine and we have our own crypto too, but I, I just think gold is always, people will, people get their head around gold much easier. So I have silver and gold, but I, th I think gold is better. And what this company has done, it, they've made it affordable for anybody. It's a small enough amount. So they're the biggest sellers of small amounts of gold in the world. And we had a guy recently through Greg, I think it was, that he bought $100,000 worth of gold from, from carrot bars, but he bought in small amounts, so they're easy to transact. So they've created uh, their own cryptocurrency as well? We have our own cryptocurrency as well, but the gold is physical gold that you actually get stored for free or it gets delivered to you by FedEx. Right, without the charges. Um, and so if you were to have an investment, what percentage would you recommend of each so that you're having a balanced like portfolio? Is it going to be silver, gold? Should you have a little bit of crypto? Like my, where do you think you're going? My question that I had to ask myself, because you know people say 5%, 10%, whatever. The question I had to ask myself is, how much of my money do I not want to lose to inflation? And my question is, my answer was, I've worked too hard. I don't want to lose anything because the government is irrationally and irresponsibly printing more than they can afford to print. So I changed, I changed a, a large percentage into gold. Well, something you guys probably didn't experience because you're in Vancouver is we actually had a week up here where you couldn't get cash. If you wanted to take a large amount of money out, um, there was a week I went to the bank and wanted cash. So I went immediately, I've got a few hundred dollars here in cash. And then none of the stores are accepting cash. Now you have to have a credit card. So it's very interesting to, to realize that that balance is going to become very important. Yeah, it's a war on cash because they can't control cash so well. So the government likes to control things to get taxes, but ultimately uh, gold will always be acceptable because it's only real money. Um, well, I've, I've paid for an electrical bill with silver. The guy, I'm like, you take a silver coin? He's like, yeah. <laughs> Greg? You had a question? He's muted still. Oh, he's muted. Greg, you have to unmute. Bottom left hand side, Greg. Bot bottom left hand side of your screen. I think Roger has to unmute him. Yeah, Roger, you, you have control of me. Oh. No, I wasn't going to make a comment. Uh, I was just saying, I forget who spoke, but for, you know, transacting in precious metals, I was going like this. Bravo. That's, that's terrific. Yeah. And then yeah. the other thing you have to look at too is what precious metal can actually earn extra income. Is that possible? To consider. Oh, 
Okay, I think the questions are winding down. Barbara, you have the last word and then back to the question for is, the last word. I think that we should have a certain amount of cash that doesn't belong to our bank that we can get at because I come from an era because of my family where the banks were closed down and people couldn't get into the bank. My girlfriend who went through 2008 in the States saw her bank boarded up. Fortunately, she had another bank. So I don't think we should leave all our money with the bank. Yeah, I, have, I agree. Um, a, a, a relative okay, had a very large amount of cash in a safe deposit box and he, he, it was in the Royal Bank. He couldn't get his, he couldn't get to his safe deposit box. It took him about a week or two weeks to get to his safe deposit box. He then took half of it out. And my question to him was, why did you only take half out? You should have taken it all out of the bank. I would never put anything in a safe deposit box and I, I don't leave too much in the bank because I don't trust the banks. I, it's not the bank so much, the government's controlling the bank or the bank's controlling the government. But um, you know, I, I come from Africa and I lived in Rhodesia just before that horrendous mess that they made with the hyperinflation. So, it happens quickly and it's unexpected, just like COVID was pretty much unexpected. Well, my example was from two weeks ago because we live in a small town. Big yeah. amounts of cash have to get shipped in. It, this yeah. is we're not, I'm not talking about 10 years ago. I'm talking about two weeks ago. Right. Oh, yeah. So you want to get, I don't leave cash in any safe deposit box and I try to have cash and money in the bank and cash, but gold is the primary thing. Greg? You have to unmute. I don't control you. Okay, you unmuted. Not in a matter of speaking, Roger, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, your, I just. Your wife was... controls you. <laughs> <laughs> you know my family too well. Um, Robin, if I may, everybody, I just want you to know that actually, when you have money in the bank now by law, uh, it was brought in, in in 2016 under your nose. You don't even know. You are classified as an unsecured lender to the bank by law. And if something goes wrong with the bank, they can take a portion of your money or they can turn it into bank bonds or whatever. I don't keep money. I only keep enough money in the bank to do basics. FYI. Call a bailing. Okay, so why don't we uh, wrap her up now? Robin, do you have any final words you'd like to share with us? No, I just think it's a, it's a good time to be able to stand back and objectively evaluate your business. <laughs> Look at alliances that you can set up with people. Um, I really believe you've got a gift to get. And, and if you're generous and, 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 and genuinely generous, not just giving to get, but if you're genuinely caring and giving, you can find a lot of people that you can partner with and joint venture with and um, it, it really works so now is the time to work together now is the time to reevaluate and to take and to make strong strong decisions 